What up, what up, folks? It's your boy, Akil, again. This time, I'm here to discuss an election post-mortem, but with a focus on a specific policy area, one that's near and dear to my heart, drug policy reform. And since I've been blessed to know quite a few people in the movement for drug policy reform in America over the past five years or so, I figured what better place to start than these friends of mine. Tonight's conversation is going to be with several friends who actually were in the same internship program that I did in D.C. four years ago with my uh, friend Randall that you hopefully saw in my last YouTube video. If not, go back and check it. You should be tuning in. I may not get that many views, but this is good material. At the top left corner of your screen, we've got my man, Andrew Livingston. Andrew? Hey, how are you doing? Good to not bad, see not you. bad. Bottom left corner, we've got uh, the lovely Cassidy West. Hi. How's everyone doing? Much better with you here, that's for sure. And in the bottom right corner, my good friend and former roommate, Sam Tracy. Hey, Kill. Cool. Hey, everybody. Looking for the conversation. And the crowd goes wild. Since you guys have a lot of on-the-ground experience in this field, why don't we just start with you explaining to us how you got into the drug policy reform movement and where each of you fits into it at present. Sam, why don't we start with you? Sure thing. Uh, so I've been involved with drug policy reform. It's 2016 now, so I guess seven years. I was really lucky that uh, I went to UConn for undergrad and I uh, was lucky that there was already an established chapter of Students for Sensible Drug Policy there. And I was involved with a lot of political organizations, the ACLU, a lot of other kind of big tent, uh, broad issue organizations. SSDP was focused solely on drug policy reform. And I found that to be really exciting. The chapter was really well organized. And so that really got me... Like, we like to say hooked on drug policy reform that really sparked my passion and got involved there both at the chapter level uh, later going on to be on the board of directors for the national nonprofit uh, SSDP is really cool in that uh, the, the board of directors is majority run by actual students who are members when they're elected elected by other students so it's really a student run organization so I was chair of the board for a few years and now I work in the marijuana industry with a company called Forefront Ventures that helps people get get licenses and operate dispensaries all over the country. Nice, nice, good stuff. Cassidy, how about you? Sure. So my background in drug policy is not as long as Sam's. I actually have more of a background in regulatory policy. So I, I worked at the Regulatory Study Center in Washington, D.C., which was a research center that focused on federal regulatory policy. So as I was looking for a change in, in pace and kind of focus, I uh, linked up with Andrew Livingston, who had a job opening at Vicente Cedarburg, which is where I work now, doing marijuana policy work. And um, I actually do regulatory policy work and compliance work primarily at Vicente Cedarburg right now. So that is my background. I've been doing that for the past two years and love working in the marijuana industry. So coolness. And how about you, Andrew? So I got uh, interested in drug policy reform sometime in college, just as a way to learn about controversial subjects that, you know, your parents don't want you to learn about. For some reason, I was more comfortable studying drugs in college than I was doing drugs. So that's what I did first. That developed into, you know, an interest in drug policy activism as a way to, you know, allow people to do with what they want with their body, as long as it doesn't hurt someone else. And so I helped to start a chapter of Students for Sensible Drug Policy early on in my sophomore year of college uh, at Colgate University in upstate New York. That's when I met Sam Tracy back in Maryland, D.C. area. From there, I kind of just kept up that interest, went out to Colorado right after graduation, well, after the summer program that I spent with you three fine individuals. Then, I, you know, essentially worked on the campaign, helped to make it happen, met a lot of people involved, and through that, helped to create one of the first non-administrative, non-legal jobs at Vicente Cedarburg, which was the law firm that helped to pass Amendment 64 now the largest cannabis business law firm in the country. I do a lot of our economic and policy work. Specifically, I'm a kind of like a cannabis economist and regulatory expert. So that's kind of where I fit in. I do a lot of the data stuff. I remember when the news of Amendment 64's success broke after that election day, I saw a picture of supporters celebrating and you were definitely right up in there. <laughs> I definitely <laughs> saw that picture too. Right, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I got lucky for some reason. Yeah, for some reason, I was in the center of uh, all the cameras. And so I got like two or three stock photos. Sam Tracy just recently got stock I photos. Saw that. For, uh, Breaking in. For, yeah, for the Massachusetts legalization win. So thankfully, we'll see more of us on random images of cannabis people celebrating. Nice, <laughs> nice. The burning question on everyone's mind, I guess, is with this remarkable 
to say the least, election result that we got last week. What do you guys think is really like the next step after this for the movement? What do you think the future of drug policy reform, especially marijuana law, is going to look like under a Donald Trump presidency? Sam, what's on your mind? Just a whole lot of uncertainty right now, unfortunately. There's tons of uncertainty in pretty much every aspect of the Trump administration because it really hasn't said that much on the policy side of things. We have statements going back to, I think, in the, the 80s or 90s. He was interviewed saying, I think we should legalize all drugs. Obviously, much more lately, he's been towing much more of the conservative line, playing to the Republican base, um, which is very much on the opposite side of that. However, one thing that I find, at least somewhat, in, not, not necessarily putting too much faith in it, but that Ted Cruz might end up being his favorite to be the first Supreme Court justice that he ends up uh, nominating. And aside from many other issues with Ted Cruz, I do know that he is among the conservatives, one of the best on marijuana policy, saying that it's a state rights issue and that we should leave it to the states. And if he was the one who was actually in charge of that, or at least one of those votes on the court who would be able to sway in that direction, I think at least as far as marijuana goes, notwithstanding all the other drug policy reforms that aren't necessarily a state by state issue, but on marijuana, a, 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 a Justice Cruz actually would probably be pretty good. So when it comes to policy, Cassidy, you work in that area. What do you think is likely to happen? Do you see any prognostication that you can make with any kind of confidence at all? Well, like Sam said, there's a lot of uncertainty. I have hope that he'll stay out of it. He has mentioned that he is states' rights. Andrew actually has a great resource, um, an interview uh, with somebody, I believe it was somebody in the Denver Post. Andrew, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, yeah, it's Brandon Ritterman from Channel 9 News. Channel 9 News. And he can tell you more about that. So, yeah. So, I mean, his, his positions are kind of nuanced if you want to look at them discreetly. But as a total, there's uncertainty because they're all over the board. Right? So sometimes he'll say things specifically on any policy issue, but that's not necessarily consistent. So that's where a lot of the uncertainty that Sam and Cassidy talked about. What he said to Brendan Rinneman specifically then, when he asked him if Chris Christie was his attorney general, would he allow Chris Christie to crack down, enforce federal law in the states where medical, medical and adult use cannabis is licensed and regulated? And he said, I would not do that. Brandon Redman then subsequently asked him again, would you allow him to do that? And Trump basically said like, no, that's not what I would do. Now the question really is, does the Department of Justice officials, who he nominates for attorney general, retain the existing Cole memorandum? And how many of the similar sort of people that are in the Justice Department that are kind of more career and might span different administrations, particularly in the Justice Department, different administrations of different parties. How many of them stay here? I think some of that has to actually do with other policy decisions that are unrelated to cannabis. Government is not a single monolith. It's a lot of different boats that take a long time to move around. How much does he, as a complete shakeup, result in a shakeup both at the, obviously the top level, he'll put in a new attorney general, but in the sub-levels there in the change in the, in the bureaucracy. That will depend in some cases on, does the Cole Memo stand, do they pull it, or do they re write it. You know, of course, there's the least difficulty if they just say, okay, let's keep the similar thing in. But my thought is that Obama administration has put a lot of holds on U.S. attorneys in, in different states when it comes to their enforcement of federal law on the marijuana issue. And how many of them have the natural inclination or desire to pursue those cases now? That's something that we don't really know. But I definitely think that compliance is going to be a bigger concern for the cannabis industry going forward because minor slip ups like accidentally selling to a, you know, a, someone underage, it's a you know, major slip up regulatorily, uh, but it's easy to have accidentally happen. Does that result in federal enforcement? And so that's really the question that we'll probably I actually have a question for you guys about the politics of these marijuana legalization ballot initiatives, I guess you could call them. To what extent, if at all, did each of you actually participate in the campaign to legalize in each of your states? Me here, I'm in Massachusetts, probably should have mentioned my intro uh, in, in the Boston area. So I wasn't not a staff member of the Question 4 campaign, but I was a volunteer in terms of going to speak at events, doing phone banking, canvassing, that sort of thing, but wasn't, say, a, a staff member running it in that sense. Uh -huh. uh, I was a full-time volunteer during the right. 64 campaign. Right. Um, and so kind of did all sorts of different little things here and there. So in the two most recent cycles, you know, I was already full time at the Sandy Cedarburg. So a lot of the work we do in different sorts of ways is assisting the campaigns, but I was not directly involved beyond 
you know, a consulting basis. See, the reason I ask is because I'm curious as to what kinds of arguments for legalization you guys have found resonate the most with ordinary people out there who are not members of the drug policy reform movement, but who are persuadable. What types of arguments do you find do the best job of just getting through to people and winning them over? Cassidy, since you're up. Yeah, uh, definitely the me the medical aspect. It's better access to medicine. It's less medicines. It's a way to get around big pharma. That's one group of people. Another way is, you know, you can appeal emotionally. The child who has 100 seizures a day, they have to take 20 pills, which knock them out, and they're not able to, like, be a kid. They don't, they're not there. And then they trade that for, you know, marijuana, and they're actually able to speak. They don't have any seizures, and they can live their life. I don't know how that I wouldn't appeal to anybody. Makes sense to me. When you hear a lot of the arguments made against legalization of marijuana in particular, what are some of the biggest concerns that you hear, whether it's, you know, activists and politicians and law enforcement officials who are opposed to legalization, or whether it's just ordinary people who are reluctant to go that far? What are the, what are the main concerns you tend to hear when it comes to marijuana specifically? Because I think at this point, most people have at least heard that marijuana isn't highly addictive and highly dangerous like, say, heroin or cocaine, right? So even people who are still reluctant to buy into marijuana legalization, what tend to be their concerns? Is it the gateway drug argument or what? Unfortunately, the gateway drug thing does still get a, a decent amount of play, even though I think it is decreasing, but that was definitely brought up all the time here in Massachusetts. The frustrating thing is, I mean, it's completely untrue with the idea being, oh, if simply the act of consuming marijuana somehow predisposes you or makes you have cravings to want to try, you know, harder drugs, that's completely incorrect. There is the small kernel of truth in that most people who say are a heroin user tried marijuana at first. People see that fact and think, oh, marijuana leads to heroin. But they also used alcohol first. They usually smoke tobacco first. They usually ate cereal first. None of those things are causal. My usual counter to that actually is that the only area where the gateway drug theory actually does have any merit is in a black market. The markets for, say, cocaine and marijuana are, are the same, that a lot of the time someone who's a dealer who, who is selling marijuana might also sell these other drugs. And so if you're getting them from one place, it's a lot easier to be off for those other drugs or to ask for them and actually receive them in comparison you know you can't go to a liquor store and ask for cocaine same way you're not going to be able to go to a marijuana dispensary that's licensed by the state to do so but if you're in the black market those markets often are, are overlapping i'm actually curious about well a couple of things when it comes to the way marijuana legalization has played out in practice in the states where it's already been on the books for a few years now probably Andrew and Cassidy will be best positioned to clear this up for me. One of the arguments for legalizing any banned substance that's high in demand, such as drugs, is that prohibition only drives it underground into the hands of the criminal element rather than stamping it out completely. And so if you legalize it, you bring it above board where it can be regulated and it can be made safer. But one of the things I've heard not sure how true it is, in places like Colorado and Washington, is that in reality, because those state governments are still taxing and regulating the hell out of the marijuana trade, the prices are still high enough that a lot of devoted marijuana users are still getting their supply from illegal underground dealers. Supposedly, the criminal element hasn't yet lost control of the industry like you would expect it to. Does that square with you guys' experiences and observations at all? Does it sound like it might be true? If so, what conclusion should we draw from that? Is that just an argument for deregulating and lightening the tax load on the industry? Or what do you make of that? Yeah, so I would say, I mean, in Colorado, prices have dropped significantly. That probably is based more on the degree of competition and the number of different licenses, particularly in the dense front range metropolitan area of Denver, uh, you know, Boulder, Aurora, places like that. The criminal element that does exist, and I'm talking about, you know, longer supply chain, actual real criminals and not your friend who grows selling to you, likely grow for the purposes of moving it out of state. I would say that, yes, there are a significant number of 
heaviest marijuana consumers who still don't purchase from retail stores, but it's more likely that they personally know the person who cultivates it. Not only has medical marijuana cultivation been legal since 2000, when the first patient caregiver medical law was passed in Colorado, but the cultivation of up to six plants is legal for anyone 21 and over. And so there's a question too, as like, what is the quote unquote black market? It's not legal to sell someone cannabis that you grew in your house, but that's not typically the sort of criminal enterprises and black markets we think about. That being said, cannabis purchasing and sales has increased continually. And in fact, September, August, and July in those three are the highest ever that have been sold, both medical and adult use-wise combined in Colorado. So sales continue to increase. We're having record sales each month. The black market will diminish. And I think it diminishes more in Colorado than maybe it would in other states because of the degree of competition we have here. So Colorado has hundreds, in fact, I think it's a, looked at it today, it's about 2,800 different licenses for all the different medical and adult use license types, including stores and infused product facilities and uh, grows and testing facilities. And so that's way more than in most other states. In fact, in, in a number of states, whether it's you know Florida with only six licenses or New York with only five five licenses, high taxes are going to increase the price. But what's really going to impre- increase the price more than anything is, is the lack of price competition because you have very few different actors. And so there, I think you'll see a, a more difficult and really just a, a longer time span at which it takes to move black market purchasers over to the legal market. Cassidy, I've got a question for you along mm-hmm. those same lines. It seems to me that, again, correct me if I'm wrong, that a lot of the greatest benefit from legalization will come if the government refrains from overtaxing and overregulating the industry. But at the same time, it would seem to me that legalization is probably easier to sell to John Q. Citizen. If you front, you know, don't worry, the government's going to regulate this so that your kids won't be able to go buy weed at the local dispensary down the street. I imagine you probably would say that even with high levels of taxation and regulation, it's still worth it to legalize rather than to perpetuate prohibition. What case would you make to that effect, to someone who's skeptical? About legalization? Yeah, even, even if the government feels it has to tax and regulate the industry heavily, if only for political reasons. I think that innovation is important and having like the freedom to be able to openly cultivate and breed and create new genetics, you're going to have better strains. It's open. I mean, you have better results of agriculture if something's legal than if something's done in the basement. And so I think the product that's going to come out of it is going to be better because it's, it's, you know, open. The research and development is allowed. And so I think that's going to bring in innovators, people who may have been cautious and getting in the industry before who may have worked in other agricultural commodity industries or genetics or something, biochemistry, whatever it is, people who have backgrounds in those industries may may not have wanted to get involved in, you know, the drug policy movement, but being that it's legal now, they might uh, bring their talents in and we'll see a lot uh, better strains, different ways to smoke weed, different product types. What's wrong with that? (laughs) Here's a question I have for all three of you. What would you say is the strongest argument against drug legalization and how would you refute it? For all drugs or for marijuana specifically? Let's focus on marijuana. So for marijuana specifically, I think one of the most convincing arguments that I found really convincing before thinking about it too much, and specifically on the medical side, is this argument that we recognize that there are medical benefits to the cannabis plant. There's a lot of important compounds inside of it. But for the same reason that if somebody is in pain, we don't tell them to chew on willow bark, we give them aspirin. The idea of, you know, you're not smoking opium, you're getting prescribed pills of morphine. And so this idea that this kind of herbal sort of smoking something, even if it has beneficial compounds in it, is not the best way to do it. And I think that makes a lot of sense at a gut level because people our age growing up in huge anti-smoking for tobacco campaigns, thinking of smoking as this really disgusting thing that is obviously terrible for your health, it'd be crazy to think otherwise. And with those other examples, it makes it sound like, oh, maybe even though I recognize that there are beneficial things, maybe it shouldn't be smoked. And we even see some states now 
not allowing smoking. But when you talk to patients who use marijuana every day just to be able to, to function, a lot of them do use edibles or tinctures or other things. And that's one of the great things about legalization is that we, as Cassidy was saying, there's a lot more innovation and varieties of products that are available. But a lot of people do still prefer smoking uh, for a range of reasons, just that it's a lot easier to do your dosage if it's a, a, an amount that's going to, to hit you very quickly, rather than you know taking an edible that could be either too much or too little and you figure it out an hour later. Um, so there are a lot of really big benefits to it. But I think in our culture, smoking has become a very gross kind of icky thing. And so centering it around this idea of, of smoking something, whether it's medically or recreational, um, I, I think has a, a strong visceral reaction. Mm -hmm. Cassidy, what do you think is uh, another strong argument for legalizing or relatively strong argument for legalization and how would you respond to it? For a strong argument for sorry. or against? Against, against. sorry. Against yeah. legal. The potency of edibles is something that we hear a lot in Colorado and access to edibles in children. That's what everyone's afraid of, you know, like lollipops that are infused or cake that's infused or brownies that, in, that are infused. Of course, it's appetite to a child. And so it's really great. I saw a, a wonderful Wonderful, not wonderful, but wonderfully made ad in Florida um, against Amendment 2 that had all sorts of candies and cakes that were infused and were like, your kids are going to get into this. Don't vote for Amendment 2. And I was like, this is absolutely ridiculous um, because actually, you know, as I work in regulatory compliance, I know that the packaging standards are so absolutely ridiculous um, <laughs> that no child could ever get into a marijuana candy if they wanted to. I mean, I guess they really could if they were really smart and they really tried, but it'd be pretty, pretty tough. And it's just multi-layers of child-resistant packaging and tons of warning labels and all these sorts of things. Getting in the hands of children these attractive edible goods is something that I hear a lot about. Honestly, if, if we package it appropriately and that we teach parents to safe storage it away from their children, I don't think that there should be an issue. You don't keep your alcohol with the lid off on the table readily available for your children to drink. So why in the world would you do that for your marijuana? <laughs> Won't someone please think of children? <laughs> Andrew, how about you? Um, strongest argument against legalization and it, other than what we've already heard and how do you tend to respond to it? In general, there's the overarching thought that not just cannabis use, but really drug use in general and the promotion of drug use increases just societal lethargy, the number of individuals that are dropping out of productive society that are, you know, maybe not contributing to the capitalistic desires of their other neighbors. And, you know, there's concerns that, you know, this will result in significant amounts of lost productivity. There's a number of different ways, you know, I would combat that first it's none of your business how much labor i decide to do and how much you know fun i decide to do uh and if anything labor capital substitution with an increase in technological advancements and increase in work productivity should result in more leisure time which uh, should or could depending on who you are be filled with enjoyable moderate recreational substance use we also really need to look at what are the effects of different drug substitution. And cannabis has a lot of beneficial effects when you look at it as alcohol beneficial effects as far as socially, with the way that it, you know, increases elation and brings people together. And so you're talking about like a leisure activity that has some of those benefits, but it has a lot less drawbacks than alcohol, particularly on the effects of the body, on the liver, on productivity the following days with results to hangovers and others. That's probably the argument there, but that's probably way over anyone's head who really would oppose marijuana legalization because at that point you're talking about labor capital substitution. What is you guys' general take on drug legalization across the board? I mean, we hear a lot nowadays about the epidemic of heroin addiction and overdoses in rural white America, especially now with Trump being elected, supposedly because of resentment in that sector of the population. So what is you guys take generally on uh, drug legalization across the board? Should we go that far with all drugs as opposed to just marijuana? Or would you decriminalize other drugs and legalize marijuana completely? Why don't each of you just toss out uh, your stock answer to that question? Because I'm sure you've gotten it before. <laughs> Damn, let's start with you. My kind of stock little soundbite there is just that I do want to legalize all drugs, but 
tomatoes are legal, alcohol is legal, codeine is legal, morphine is legal. There's a huge wide range of legality that when people hear, you know, about legalizing drugs or, or legalizing heroin, well, sometimes their mind jumps straight to, okay, you want to legalize it like alcohol. There's a huge range of legality of from no restrictions to tons of restrictions. And a lot of the time people's assumption is that you mean no restrictions or minimal. But you can legalize heroin in a manner similar to uh, other countries where you have safe injection rooms, um, where it's not the sale it isn't legal, but if someone's addicted to heroin, they can be provided with a clean supply by the government in order to help wean them off of it as a, as a means of treatment. And I think that sort of thing, particularly decriminalizing drug possession like they've done in Portugal, I'm really excited about that being the next frontier of drug policy reform. I think the state-by-state -state approach of decriminalizing drug possession is really the next logical place for us to go after many states have already essentially gotten marijuana over with. Cassidy? Uh, yeah, so I agree 100% with Sam. I think all drugs should be legal and then that and legal means regulated. Yeah, that's it. We have seven minutes. So I'm going to pass it on to Andrew. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, I'd say different substances are legal in different ways, sometimes even for different people based upon different ages or licensing. No matter how old you are, you can't drive a car without a driver's license. And yet, you know, for some substances, we just put different age limits on purchase and sometimes age limits on use. So whether that's tobacco or alcohol, as we get into different sorts of substances, you can have, you know, dynamics in which you have only possession is legal, although I don't really necessarily think that it's fully legal. Legal. Under those processes, you'd probably have situations like in Switzerland where they're doing heroin maintenance with heroin uh, rather than how we wean people off heroin with methadone in the United States. Really what that means to me is that the supply chain is legal in such a way that you really don't have illegal operators and criminals growing those substances and manufacturing those substances and then selling those substances. We can deal with the harms of drug use a lot easier necessarily than we can deal with the harms associated with illegal drug markets. To go off of that point, it's important that drugs are legal so that people know what they're purchasing. A big problem in drug policy across the board is people are not educating themselves or testing their drugs and finding out what they're using and putting into their bodies and where it came from and what kind it is. And it has a big effect. Being able to know what exactly you're buying, that's huge. I would definitely recommend there's a video that discusses testing your drugs, research Research it. Research testing your drugs. Everybody, please. If you're going to use drugs, please test them. That's all I have to say. <laughs> okay, so we've got two minutes left, just under two minutes. So really quickly, what advice would you guys give to folks who might be watching this and are curious about the best thing that they can do to help this movement along? The folks who agree with it, of course. What, what, what can they do to contribute to drug policy reform? Donate to SSDP, Students for Sensible Drug Policy. They're doing great work. If you're a student, join them. If you're not a student like us, uh, donate to them. You smashed that softball <laughs> right out of the park, Sam. I knew I could count on you guys to pick up on that <laughs> opportunity for promotion of SSDP in particular. Anything else you guys would add, uh, Cassidy and Andrew? Yeah, I would say just get involved at your local level, particularly if you're in a state that just passed marijuana reform. So one of the biggest things that happens is varying different localities decide whether or not they want to allow for businesses to restrict certain aspects of those businesses, really to make you know home possession or cultivation rights more difficult. So what you want to do is get involved to ensure that not only you, but your neighbor's newfound rights are protected. Cool. Yeah, and get it. Yeah, great. <laughs> and get, him, get involved at uh, Google Dance Safe and um, other organizations that are drug policy organizations. That's all I had to say. Great. Thanks so much to all three of you for all the knowledge that you've kicked here with me tonight. Wish you all the best. Keep fighting the good fight. And um, I'm sure we'll do this again in another few months and pick your brains again to see where our drug policy reforms have gone from here after the election.